Welcome to another edition of Expanding Mind. I'm your host, Eric Davis, continuing our conversations about the cultures of consciousness. It's uh, fun times for me over here. My book, High Weirdness, is, uh, is just starting to, to see physical reality. I've had a few copies sent my way, and they've, they've gone the way of, of early copies. Um, but it, 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 the book should be in the stores by the end of the month, and I'll be doing a lot of events around that, a lot of uh, podcasts, and um, I'll be doing some future podcasts on expanding mine on some of the themes in the book. Uh, we'll be talking with folks about Terrence McKenna, Robert Downtown Wilson, and uh, Philip K. Dick uh, in some podcasts coming up over the next couple of months. I'll also be doing a lot of traveling, uh, so if you want to see if I'm doing an event in your area, please check out uh, technosis.com, T-E-C-H-G-N-O-S-I-S.com, and look under the events uh, page, and I'll be mentioning things on this uh, show here. Uh, just to mention a few events coming up in the Bay Area this weekend. Uh, I'll be doing a uh, participating in the Awaken Future Summit uh, at UCSF, uh, sponsored by the local co- Consciousness Hacking Crew. And that should be an interesting uh, exploration of psychedelics, mind machines, and uh, uh, future, future consciousness work. And at the end of the month, I'll be part of uh, Queering Psychedelics, uh, another gathering here in San Francisco, um, sponsored by the Shakruna and Bia Labachi, who we've had on the show uh, before. And I'll be talking about the history of, of uh, queer psychedelic counterculture. And that should be a very interesting conference, the first one. Uh, of its kind, and it's a, the right place to do it. So uh, check that out and other things on uh, the podcast. And then, as always, if you're a regular listener and you like this show, please consider um, spreading the word, writing a review, posting to uh, Apple, Mac, iTunes, whatever. Uh, it's, uh, it's always helpful to um, have some feedback there, and it's really one of the best ways to get the word out about the show. And even though I try not to be craven about uh, quantifying likes, uh, which, which is a sickness of our, of our age and, and really unhelpful in, in, in many ways, um, I nonetheless like the sense, as we all do, that things are sort of progressing, word is spreading, uh, momentum is building. Um, so please help me uh, continue to manifest this show by uh, bringing in some fresh listeners, which always um, makes it a more fun operation. So as you know, uh, one of the topics of my, my new book, High Weirdness, is weirdness um, and what exactly weirdness is and how do we think about uh, uh, about weirdness. And one of the ways I got into that was an, an interesting problem that, that came up studying um, when I got my PhD in religion, studying a little bit on the sort of more uh, neuroscientific, sociobiological, reductive approach to religion, where they tend to kind of break down religion and religious motivations to uh, evolutionary psychology to neuro- neurology or neuroscience or cognitive philosophy, cognitive theory, ways of understanding the mind, generally pretty reductive ways of understanding the mind. And they spend a lot of time thinking about how certain emotions feed into religion. You know, fear is one that a lot of people like to talk about. Uh, then there's a whole sort of world of like studies of obsessive compulsive disorder and how you can see that kind of uh, those sorts of behaviors uh, undergirding and motivating a lot of religious ritual. But one interesting thing that's pointed out by some um, uh, some scholars of religion is that how little attention is paid to one of the, to my mind, more significant emotions we get to experience in in our short spell on Earth, uh, which is wonder or awe. These are emotions. They, they're, they're complex. They involve physiological states. They're recognizable. Uh, they have you know, tremendous feelings associated with them. They're quite motivating. They undergird a lot of religion. They undergird a lot of art, uh, a lot of experiences in our life, in, in love, in nature. Um, and yet there's often a very little, very little paid attention to them from this cognitivist perspective because it's sort of elusive. It's not really exactly clear what these things are for. Like, what exactly do, does the caveman need wonder for? Fear makes sense. Desire makes sense. Um, but if wonder is a little bit more curious, and so that might have been one of the reasons that people have paid less 
uh, attention to it. But there are other reasons to be paying attention to wonder, and, and one of those is uh, leads to our guest today, Mary Jane Rubenstein, is a professor of religion and feminist gender and sexuality studies at Wesleyan, and she's written three totally cool books. Like, it's just, she's, you know, it's just, we're talking scholarship here, you know, this is not some crazy edge stuff or whatever, and yet uh, she's written three very different books, but they all sort of at least for me, resonate with really core issues um, that involve the the weird uh, and and a lot of other things. And her first book uh, takes on this issue of wonder. It's called Strange Wonder, The Closure of Metaphysics and the Opening of Awe. And I want to talk uh, with her a little bit about that at the beginning because I think it's a really good way to uh, open up the larger conversation that we'll be having. Um, her second book is about the multiverse, so the idea in physics of the multiverse and how do we think about this in terms of the long arc of, uh, of stories of cosmology, of the narratives of, of the cosmos that we find in religion, uh, what's threatening about the multiverse, what's liberating about the multiverse, how do we understand these physics concepts within this larger uh, uh, kind of arc of human storytelling. It's called uh, Worlds Without End. And her most recent book is called Pantheologies, God's World's Monsters. Uh, and it resonates in a number of ways with things that we talk about on the show, particularly issues of uh, the new animism, of how to think multiplicity, how to think pluralism. Uh, you know, one of the approaches of this show is trying to be kind of radically pluralist in my approach to experience, to philosophy, to uh, other people, to thinking about how we think about uh, a reality as not so much a, a singular world uh, through which we must make our way through our individual perspectives, but something that may in some essential way uh, be multiple, uh, which is a, a, a liberating and terrifying thought in about equal measure. Um, that kind of pluralism is very much a part of what I'm doing with High Weirdness. I'm very much a, a William Jamesian, and I was pleased that, uh, uh, that, that Mary Jane talks about James in uh, Pantheologies and really pushes him beyond where he was comfortable going. So he kind of laid out a possibility of a sort of pluralist, almost polytheistic way of embracing uh, a pantheist possibility, not leaving the concept of God in the, in the dust, uh, but also kind of quavered a little bit before the, the, the multiplicity and the, the kind of uh, um, richness that that view uh, can suggest. So I was very, you know, very pleased to read all this marvelous stuff. And I, but I still wanted to welcome Mary Jane onto the show, of course. Uh, thanks for being with us on, on Expanding Mind. Thank you so much for the invitation. This is thrilling. Great. And I, I do want to start with wonder because... Uh, you know, I can't. I, it, it feels maybe intuitively that that part of your whole project started with wonder, with the, with mm -hmm. both thinking about what it means, but also uh, dipping your toes in it. Because in some sense, I don't see how you could have found your way through all these fascinating concepts while remaining, you know, deeply rigorous. At the same time, there's this sense of a kind of um, frustration with the limitations of doing philosophy in a conventional way in 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 a, in a purely historical sense or uh, in, in working always within uh, systems of thought, systems of concepts, understanding how they develop, that there's some underlying uh, a, a sort of opening that wonder seems to have allowed you to uh, enter into into your own thinking. So just as a way of talking a little bit about, um, uh, about your book, but, but hopefully also about your own motivations and, and how you kind of came to these questions, is what is the relationship be, between wonder and the, the, the act of philosophizing, the work of, of, of philosophy, as you lay it out? Right. Right. That's a, thank you. Um, in, a, in, a, in a word, it's... Um parasitical i think um wonder is said to be the um well i guess we'd now call it affect right um but not many people who uh have written about wonder in the philosophical traditions had that uh, had that 
at least hip vocabulary um, to talk about it. Um, wonder is said to be like the mood or the emotion or now the affect uh, that gets philosophy going. And yet it seems to me that most mainline Western philosophy does everything that it can um, to distance itself as far as possible from the unknowing of wonder, the vulnerability that it puts um, the, the human subject in, even the threat that it poses to the integrity of the subject itself. Um, so it's it's basically this um, this this parent that philosophy keeps trying to kill, sort of names and then tries to destroy at the same time. Briefly, yeah, that's how I would describe it. Yeah, and then and we, we find it right at right at the at the beginning of things, so to speak, with 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 Socrates. And one of the things that was that interested me is is not that there was an important relationship between wonder and philosophy, but th- that at least in the way that um, Socrates presents the problem, uh, it's it's the origin or the beginning or the first move. It it is what motivates. The philosophical enterprise. So that that sense of of uh, of being a spark or a beginning of things. And mm-hmm. what what exactly is the character of wonder, at least in 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 Socrates' language? What and what what kind of is, is associated with a, with with that affect? Right. Um, so here to get a little more specific, I think there are two. Um, I do think there's a kind of bifurcation at the outset of the Western tradition in um, styles of wonder and uh, locations of it. So for, for Socrates, for example, um, wonder does come at the beginning of a philosophical inquiry, certainly, as a kind of initial destabilization that makes you want to keep thinking. Um, but it also increases as knowledge grows. So if you're in a classic Socratic conversation, um, the farther you advance, the more you'll realize that the stuff you thought was really um, stable and steady is is far less um, far less grounding grounding and grounded than you had thought it was. And that feeling of of unmooredness and ground and, and sort of wise unknowing. Uh, is is what he's he's referring to um, at least in the Platonic dialogues, uh, particularly Theaetetus, uh, by by wonder. So wonder, in that sense, is uncomfortable. Uh, it's related to fear, to a little bit of nausea, to queasiness. Um, it's it's amazement, um, but also a, a sort of frightened amazement. Um, so not just a kind of placid, uh, excited happiness about things or anything like that. Um, in the Aristotelian mode, uh, and of course this comes right on the heels of Plato, wonder becomes really confined to the beginning of philosophy. And it's this brief discomfort that makes you want to know more. Um, and then the moment you end up knowing more, you shut that wonder down. And then you use a little more wonder to learn something more complicated, and then you shut that wonder down. Um, so there, in the again, in the Aristotelian uh, register, it's really just a, this sort of initial spark, uh, but it's not what we're aiming for. For Socrates, it's what we're aiming for. We want this kind of creative, unknowing uh, form of wisdom. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, it, it makes me think about the the contemporary discourse, which you find both both in the academy and, and increasingly outside, and, I, and, and generally in a very refreshing way, which uh, has to do with... with reconceiving philosophy as a as a practice as a, as a mm-hmm. way of living and you know we can talk about it in terms of Pierre Hadot within philosophy a new way of understanding especially ancient philosophy is to go look these guys weren't just thinking it they were always motivated by the question of how to live and how thinking serves the question of how to live and how the practices of life serve thinking and it, I, to me that seems like one of the 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 fresher impulses in contemporary philosophy, and you see it in popular uh, uh, writings as well, is this sort of g- grappling with philosophy as a way of, of living. And it seems to me that this question of wonder really lies at the at the heart of it, that, that in order to really be practicing philosophy, at least in this more Platonic Socratic mode, uh, uh, as opposed to the Aristotelian, that part of what you're, you're doing is... is is moving into that those spaces of discomfort uh, of of the precisely where you thought you might th- these ideas might take you away from you know you're like you thought well finally we're going to get some clear ideas these clear ideas are going to help motivate our thinking motivate our action in the world and yet the more I sit with them the more I realize that they're fringed and even composed to some degree of this sense of vertiginous not knowing and that to really practice then is to be 
is to invite those feelings and to, and to work with those feelings. Right. right. But, but this isn't what happens, mostly. You mean in the, in the sort of long run of Western philosophy? Exactly. Right. And, then, and, and there we can see the, you know, the complicity of the long run of Western philosophy um, with certainly the Industrial Revolution, um, with the fusing of science in a particular kind of technology, um, which is aiming for a particularly instrumentalizing kind of knowledge um, that doesn't really have much time for uncertainty or vertiginousness. That's yeah. vertigo. Vertigo, yeah. that's a noun. Vertigo's a noun. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of, of uh, something we, we talked recently on the, on the show about. We've had uh, t- talked to a couple of quantum physics folks. And um, that in the, even in the history of, of, of physics, you can see that the first generation of, of quantum physics thinkers <laughs> who were very interested in philosophical questions seem to be, you know, like bring it on, bring on the wonder, bring on the confusion, bring on the vertigo that seems to be implied in these ways of thinking. And that even though none of those problems or conundrums were solved, they remained absolutely essential to the the conceptual framework and, and questions around quantum physics, that following that first generation, you have this whole long generation through World War II in the 50s and the 1960s, where the whole the whole thing was shut up and calculate. It was just yeah. like, we don't need to think about those things. We can just make electronics work. Don't ask those questions. You're not going to get a degree yeah. if you ask those questions. Just mm-hmm. make it work. And it's almost like a, a a quintessence of this process that you describe of kind of suppressing the wonder in order to get the job done of modern industry and, and capitalism. Right. In order to, I mean, in order to get our cell phones working, in order to get satellite technologies moving, um, yeah, you absolutely have to stop paying attention to those questions of how it can possibly be working. I, you know, Richard Feynman uh, has a famous lecture in which he says, you know, don't ask how can this be the case when, with respect to the quantum. You will never know. Um, just just think of nature as a sort of intriguing, delightful thing. She's entrancing. And if you can think of her as entrancing, um, then you won't be so bothered by her and you'll be able just to figure out how, how she works and you know get your job done. And as, as David Kaiser says, right, shut up and calculate. This is absolutely what... And in, and in, this, in this sense, I think contemporary physics takes on the mantle of... Um, sort of 17th century philosophy and really frees philosophy in the mid 20th century to start asking again these big sort of opening ungrounding questions because the physicists now are doing this instrumentalizing stuff a lot better than philosophers have ever been able to do it. Yeah, yeah. God, there's so many things that are opened up there. I mean, one, one thing I just wanted to point out with the Feynman quote is it, is it, it also is a, it's a really nice expression of, of what your work is about, which is to recognize that, you know, he might have been sort of using that language in a in a sort of, you know, helpful metaphoric way. Well, imagine that there's a sort of enchantress and just accept mm-hmm. that that's part of reality. And, and you as a, as a historian of philosophy and as a historian of religion, as someone who's interested in religious thinking, does not believe uh, that religious thinking is something that we just simply overcome and leave in the dust as we become more enlightened or something, uh, that they, it persists in a variety of ways and in some ways uh, should be celebrated for such. Um, that you see in all of that uh, a, a way of thinking, a way of relating to nature that has a distinct theological dimension to it, which is you know what you're what you're looking at in in pantheologies. This this possibility that nature, the material world, matter in its most basic, concrete sense, can itself be understood through a religious or sacred. Um, Lens, and this is a very powerful idea and a very uh, terrifying one uh, mm-hmm. to some of these traditions that you've that you've outlined, in, in, uh, especially in terms of the the suppression of wonder. So, is there a connection between your interest in pantheism, this idea of a sacred material cosmos, 
uh, and the the questions of wonder that you that you had brought up in the earlier book. Yeah, I think that the clearest connection. It, I mean, it, it initially I wasn't really thinking of any, and then I at the end of the pantheism book, as I was I was writing the last chapter, and I thought, oh damn it, I'm back at wonder. I I had not aimed to get here, um, but it kind of surprised me. Um, I think the clearest connection can be seen in the figure uh, for me at least can be seen in the figure of Albert Einstein, and it, this gets at some of what you were saying earlier about. Um, the first generation of quantum physicists. So Einstein has this idea that um, he's challenged once to say whether or not he believes in God. And he responds that he believes in God uh, who works as and through the order of nature itself, not some you know humanoid dude in the skies uh, interfering with the normal course of events. Um, and in saying that he affirms, he says, I affirm Spinoza's God, right? A God who works through and as the order of nature. Um, this is effectively a pantheist proclamation. He is saying that what we mean by God and what we mean by nature or the order of nature are the same thing. Um, so I take Einstein as a pretty safe, straightforward pantheist. Um, Einstein also um, professes in the face of this sort of divinely infused universe um, and absolute reverent sort of reverential wonder at the cosmos that he calls the cosmic religious sense it just fills him with astonishment and appreciation and adoration really um, what i find interesting about einstein's wonder is that it is entirely sunny it, it, he he uh he is uh, in awe of nature he's amazed by it he's um and there's none of the kind of frightening, terrifying, kind of grim sort of sub sublimity that um, earlier thinkers and theorists of wonder um, would have attested to. Um, and I, I, I think this has actually everything to do with Einstein's reluctance um, to affirm the quantum or quantum theory as a final way of understanding what's going on at the microscopic level, right? He hated the quantum. Um, and the reason I think he, well, the reason he did hate the quantum was that it introduced not just uncertainty, but indeterminacy to the very fundamental structures of the universe. And that I think scared the hell out of him. And he was unable and unwilling to integrate his awe of the sort of regularity of the, the general relative, uh, sort of large structure cosmos uh, with his terror and horror uh, at the small scale microscopic universe. If he had, I think he would have gotten something like um, a more kind of um, rounded uh, understanding or a rounded sort of experience affect of, of wonder. I, I love the way you're connecting these, these two faces of wonder. It seems really important to me and not, not just in terms of the story that, that you're telling, but in terms of our own, you know, personal sense of what this part of our lives is like, what this part of our lives that is that is ha is marked by wonder or marked by awe, mm -hmm. as a motivating factor, as a, as something to cherish and as something to have to deal with, which is that there is a tendency still to to pull Einstein's move, which is to kind of put it under the category of delightful awe, and mm -hmm. you know, you hear this very much in the rhetoric of. NASA or the rhetoric of this uh, of space science like oh the beautiful awesome yeah. amazement right. of the heavens and you're like mm -hmm. well sure okay but you know I'm also capable of looking up in the heavens and feeling whatever uh, uh, Pascal's sense yeah, of right. this terrifying emptiness uh, right. uh, and the sort of overwhelming uh, horror, even of just the sheer size of of the universe as a, as a kind of itself a kind of powerful state of mind that's related to wonder, but it's not the same thing as this kind of Disneyfied mm -hmm. wonder that we get as part of the way that science and contemporary science and technology and capitalism tell a story about itself. Oh, the wondrous new powers of this da 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 da. Right. Um, it seems really important to your sense of, of wonder as well as some related affects that have to do with these, uh, with, with pantheism as well to not shy away from that, let's call it dark side or the, mm -hmm. the vertigo side or the, mm -hmm. the, the freaky side. Um, that's also very much what I was, you know, when I'm, when I'm using weirdness in my own project, that's something that I've been 
playing with is like how weirdness is both enchanted, you know, and has in that element of of a, like a, a Disney sense of an enchanted universe or a marvelous, you know, creatures in the the sylvan fields, but it also has this this under uh, undertow. What what how, you know how how do you how do you think about the relationship between the like light and dark side of wonder as a right. motivating affect? Right. Again, I, I think that the 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 importance really of the um, of owning up to and coming to terms with uh, the more um, discomforting uh, elements of wonder uh, is important precisely uh, when we get to this question of um, action, political motivation that seems to be sort of coursing subterraneanly here. Um, It's not just because I think it is the case that humans are sort of desubjectifyingly terrified in space that it's it's not because it's it's true. So we have to somehow, uh, I, 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 I just don't think it's, I don't think this sort of rosy image of the awe-inspiring universe is very helpful. Um, I think it can be unhelpful on the one hand and uh, actually damaging on the other. And and here, here are two ways of getting at that. Um, unhelpful. Uh, I think any appreciation of the um, lush uh, beauty of forests and their uh, you know, the interconnectedness of trees and the ways that they're able symbiotically to work with mushrooms to get messages from tree to tree to tree, right? That astonishing, beautiful, and rosily awe-inspiring um, insight and, um, and emotion uh, is politically useless without an absolute horror uh, in the face of what we have done to old growth forests and really any forest at all. Um, and without that that terror of the, the um, rapid uh, loss of this amazing, beautiful, right? It's, it's this, um, Heidegger kind of got at this, and I, I, I hesitate to quote Heidegger because he's terrible, but um, he was right on wonder that there's this, this um, pairing of the sort of groundlessness and fragility of things that c- comes right along with your awe of the beauty of them. Um, and without that, um, that terror that then inspires kind of the rage that does political work, um, we don't actually get the forests that we love. We don't get that we don't have a, a chance of, of, of having them, um, of seeing them into the future of, of, of preserving them um, or, you know, even nurturing them in any way. I think that, so that's, that's the sort of um, neglectful side of it. I think actively the issue is that when NASA goes, goes into space and says, wow, it's so amazing. It's so incredible and denies precisely that desubjectifying vertigo of um, just bouncing aimlessly through space and feeling utterly decentered. Um, it can then just blithely announce plans to colonize Mars and to colonize Venus and to just keep advancing this um, narcissistic human project uh, without thinking too much about why it might be doing that. So it right, sets up these projects to kind of shore up human sovereignty again in the face of this vulnerability, precisely because it's not acknowledging the vulnerability. I mean, most of the Apollo astronauts ended up being fundamentalist Christians after they got back down to Earth, I think precisely because they were so terrified of what it was out there that they saw that they needed something super grounding when they got back down. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's really uh, that's really interesting, and it does seem to be turning on this this issue of vulnerability because, of course, when if you think about um, let's say a, a more uh, disturbing disturbing or discomforting parts of na- nature, let's say a lot of it has to do with the way in which it's just foregrounding our own fragility or our own mm-hmm. uh, mortality. So you know, when not there's not a lot of us that just like truly love like maggots writhing in a corpse. It's you know, it's kind of amazing and it's certainly wonderful in the sort of etymological sense, but it's. But it's, you know, it's a bit much. And, right. well, what's going on there? It's because we can't hide at that point. We can't hide in even the way that our more exalted feelings of wonder have an implication of, of immortality or an implication of some sort of, you know, larger framework that we're a part of. Instead, we're like confronted with the reality of our decaying bodies. And to be able to actually 
really experience the wonder of some of those things requires us to fully acknowledge our vulnerability and then also the way that, as you point out, the the nature itself is is extremely vulnerable, particularly now, <laughs> now that we're we we've set in motion all of these these enormous uh, these enormous engines, and there's, so there's something really really powerful there. But I, you know, I want to get back to Heidegger because there was one question I had about wonder that I, I was really happy to see how you how you dealt with it because it comes up a lot, particularly as someone who's interested in in esotericism and the occult and paganism and mm. in enchanted modern worldviews with all of their definitely problematic aspects. One thing that you just keep coming up against, if you're sort of interested in this in this current in these currents, is the, a sort of intellectual position that says, "Look, wonder the amazement of nature, the the attraction of um, the unknown, the the sort of edges of of the irrational is it's just fundamentally dangerous. It feeds mm-hmm. into reactionary uh, points of view, mm-hmm. and it must be extirpated from any kind of real intellectual and political engagement with our contemporary moment. And you approach this question specifically by looking at. Heidegger and and Hannah Arendt's critique of Heidegger in in the sense that part of what we can say, part of one one way to explain how he was able to embrace national socialism was that he sort of got the wonder thing wrong. And for for Arendt, as you uh, describe it, she's like, look, he, he... he, he stopped philosophizing. He stayed in wonder when he should have yeah. been philosophizing. Right. So talk about that a little bit more and, and the way in which you respond to that that claim, because I think it's it's really important the way that you that you respond to it. Yeah, my that's thanks for this. This is my sense is that so Arendt is writing a um basically like a long toast for Heidegger's 80th birthday. And she's trying to stay in relation to him even after his disastrous commitment to national socialism and his having alienated nearly everybody he had known. Um and what she says is, look, um, those of us who want to follow great teachers often find ourselves frustrated to see them making such absurd political decisions. Um, And she uses the example of Thales, the ancient philosopher who was apparently so uh, entranced with the stars above him that he fell into a well at his feet, right? And this is the image of the philosopher. He's just, his head is in the clouds, so he falls into a well. And she says, Heidegger is just like a modern day Thales. He was so lost in wonder um, that he failed to see uh, what was right in front of him, which is to say the, um, the, um, particularly the anti-Jewish danger of national socialism. Um, so wonder, she says, is the problem. He got stuck in wonder. What he should have done was to use his wonder more instrumentally in, say, an Aristotelian fashion, in a Cartesian fashion. Descartes has a, has a whole um, remedy for wonder. Basically, you can you take little doses of it, and then you um, you let it go as you've uh, attained knowledge. So Arendt is is commending um, this kind of instrumentalizing use of wonder. You use a little bit to, to introduce a little bit of discomfort, and then you get yourself to solid ground and to knowledge and to understanding and get yourself away from wonder. Um, I don't think this is right, um, at least not um, if wonder means what Heidegger understood it to mean. Um, my sense, rather, as you've said, is that Heidegger, if, if, again, it, we, can, we can take lots of people's diff- de- definitions of wonder, but if we're using Heidegger's understanding of wonder, it seems like the problem really was Heidegger's inability or reluctance or just just unwillingness uh, to remain in the kind of wonder that he himself theorized. Um, and that kind of wonder is, uh, it's again, this sort of two-step process of being shocked um, by what it is you're seeing, experiencing, understanding, uh, witnessing, um, and then uh, the, on the other hand, being, being terrified by it, being frightened by it. Um, and both of these steps for Heidegger requires a relentless attentiveness to the everyday. Um, that he he one of his he does a critical reading of Plato's Cave, in which he argues that the real work happens not in the the sky, the 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 open of the space outside the cave, but in the actual cave itself. Learning to see um, things 
as they actually present themselves, this is what is is shocking and this is what is awesome or awe inspiring. Um, so at least my argument there is that this like rigorous attentiveness to the everyday to, uh, toward which Heidegger is calling thinking is precisely what he was not doing. Um, not, for example, seeing the you know burned out storefronts, uh, Kristallnacht, uh, the, the Jewish professors being kicked out of universities, um, people being shipped away on train. Like, th that, uh, those were very clear signs that a rigorous attentiveness to the everyday, which is presumably built into Heidegger's understanding of wonder, um, should have uh, prevented him from. I think that he rather got himself into this um, completely uh, deracinated notion of some coming metaphysical revolution, right? Um, he had some sort of precisely some certainty about it that was precisely unwilling to abide the uncertainty of what was actually happening all around him. Yeah, that's great. There's what there's one sentence you have to describe his attitude. The, the, the positive side of it is this a ceaseless attunement to the to uncanniness of everyday life. And mm -hmm. I and I was thinking about this, this, uh, this tension between, you know, Arendt and, he and he or your reading of, of Heidegger on this one. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of our own, you know, contemporary condition, it, it, it's like looking at the, how people are handling the the, the unfolding dis crisis or disaster. Uh, it's it's interesting how often people seem to hide in a kind of return to instrumentalizing. Like it's like, okay, well, we have a technology that can that can do this. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm going to like invest in this and like get a new thing, and you know, and that's going to be able to sort of organize my uh, my fear at at the yeah. at the uh, audacious impossibility of of so many of the issues that we face. Whereas if you stay with the the uncanniness, it's just getting more and more uncanny that the actual texture of the everyday as it transforms under the conditions of late capitalism and climate change and, okay. you know, social pressure and the collapse of the Enlightenment project and all these things that are happening, that it's, you don't have to try very hard to see the f fabric of your average, ordinary, quotidian day as stitched through with this uh, uncanniness and an uncanniness that hopefully doesn't paralyze, hopefully doesn't motivate, uh, you know, a return to sort of uh, you know, nationalist fantasies of, of breakthrough mm -hmm. or cosmic revolutions, but instead does what uh, uh, Donna Haraway talks about of just, you know, staying with the trouble of like right. just getting closer to that, that, that texture. So it, it, it seems like a very important tension and it's, it's I, I'm I'm tired of watching and hearing intellectuals kind of replay Arendt's move as a solution when it actually mm -hmm. looks like you know what some uh, critics call solutionism, like a sort of way that mm -hmm. contemporary technological culture sort of offers solutions for problems that it creates uh, mm -hmm. as a kind of almost like weird feedback loop that avoids the affect reckoning with the situation that that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that? Um, do you know that that essay? It's a 1968 or so essay by Lynn White called uh, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. Um, you you he, mentioned that in the book. Yeah. Yeah. He claims in that um, piece that the problem with, um, well, that the, the historical roots of the ecological crisis are our um, understanding of the earth as something that is there for us and that offers up resources to us. Um, and he understands this to be a product of a sort of collaboration of Christianity and early techno science. Um, and so he says that right there, and I think this is, this cuts right through Donna Haraway's thought that the promise of techno fixes of, you know, planetary hacking, um, the, the reason it remains that these, these, problems remain solutions to problems they, they themselves have caused is that we actually need to step back into the whole worldview that produced this um, notion of nature as something to be used uh, in the first place, that it all uh, operates this way. I think also about the, um, the crisis of black men and women being assassinated by the police and body cameras uh, being an answer to this right that, that that like that's all we need to solve anti-black racism and anti-black violence is just a better camera and if we turn on the camera um this this sort of clutching to these techno fixes um i think gives us this 
pleasing sense that we've done something right, but and and then delivers us from precisely this this uh, this discomfort um, and uh, and horror at say anti blackness and the American landscape. Um, but it it it, it, pers- it just in in telling us that we've done something about it anesthetizes us, I think, to the problem. Well, this is a great setup for, you know, we've been talking about pantheologies a little bit, but not, not as much as I would have liked. There's yeah, sorry. All, it always, no, no, it's not your fault. It always goes too, too fast. It's just, you know, that's what these conversations are like. But it seems to me that one of the things you're doing in pantheologies is, you know, you're not, as you say, you're not an apologist uh, for pantheism, although right. sometimes in a good way you get close, uh, but you're trying to figure out, well, what would it mean to think this way? What would it mean to think that, not that God or the sacred is in nature, but that it is nature, or it, and that, that the material world as we understand it, and the sacred or the religious uh, w- world is, is the same thing, that 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 becomes a way for you to think about this problem that Haraway presents us with, is that if we're going to get down and dirty with the consequences of Western thinking, of, of exploitative thinking, of the, that conjunction of Christianity and, and technological science, we need alternatives. We need to be inspired by other stories, counter stories, uh, that enable us to create, to get some space around it. And, and that seems to be a lot of what you're doing uh, with pantheologies, and particularly by emphasizing this is a you know places to 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 dive in is just what is it that's so threatening and so in your terms monstrous mm-hmm. about this concept when you trace it uh, historically this idea of pantheism. Right. So the idea of pan- so the, the term pantheism is a Western term. It's invented by a French intellectual in the late 17th century to refer to the work of Spinoza and some other people. Um, so it's a Western term, um, but it's a Western term of almost exclusive derision. It's a word that people use when they want to make fun of somebody else's position. Um, the position is something like uh, uh, what we mean by God is what we mean by world, um, uh, whether you know this this earth or the entire universe, but that God and world are the same thing. That's just, that's what God is. God means world, right? Um, It has been so, I mean, hilariously, unanimously demonized by the Western tradition that gives it its name in the first place. Um, Because um, aligning or equating God and the material universe um, ends up a to God all of the characteristics that Western monotheism wants to protect God from. So um, materiality is the big one, right? If God is the world, if God is the universe, God is in some (laughs) constitutive way um, material. And of course, the the God of Western monotheism is anything but material, utterly disembodied. So um, the pantheist God would have to be material. Um, The pantheist God would have to be in some way uh, multiple, sort of aligned with the, the crazy um, manyness of the universe itself rather than rigorously singular, so violates the principle of singularity. Um, And this God begins to look also sort of dark and feminine because these are uh, attributes that the West has traditionally associated with matter. Matter is always feminized. I mean, from Aristotle to Richard Feynman, matter is feminized. Um, And matter is also rendered in sort of dark, primitivizing terms. So in one fell swoop, the pantheist god insults the whiteness, the maleness, the disembodiment, and the singularity, um, and the unchangingness of the Western metaphysical god. So that that, that seems to be the big problem. Yeah, and then that raises this really interesting issue then, is that is this way of thinking valuable as something to occupy in a mode of resistance and overcoming and pushing back against the consequences of this uh, dominant um, Christian techno-scientific tradition? Or, you know, do you just sort of throw it all, you know, under the bus? And and, and the way to, add, to like maybe telegraph that question is... There's a lot of people who would say, look, yeah, we're, we're, we, we need to have a new understanding of materialism, one that's not dominated by these, um, by, by exploitative concepts, one that respects the multiplicity of matter, the, the, the vitality of matter, uh, whether we think in terms of the you know, Gaia hypothesis or the, the, the so-called new materialisms that you find in philosophy. But a lot of those people would say, we don't need religion. We don't need the sacred. We don't need any of that stuff anymore. We're, we're done with that whole that whole tradition. 
you offer a different way of thinking about that. And, and that, I think, is, again, really important part of your, of your thinking is, is you, you also push back against the, the, either the idea that we can completely overcome these, these, mm-hmm. these aspects of, of human culture, human consciousness, relationality, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the cosmic experience, um, but also that we don't necessarily want to and, and that there are reasons to dive into this almost a, a kind of polytheistic paganism in terms of a way of, of, of revivifying or, or, or being able to be more clearly in touch with the multitudinous, emergent, vital quality of, of a new materialism. Right. Yeah. Um, so there are probably five or six ways to answer this question. I think I'm going to try to choose two. Um, the question, as I understand it, is why not just get rid of the question of God or religion entirely, right? If we're affirming the goodness of creation, if we're affirming the um, agential nature of matter, matter's capacity to do things, why not just say matter can do things, right? Why do you, what, what does God have to do with that? Why do you have to theologize it? Why do you have to bring it into some kind of religious register? That's creepy. We don't like it. Um, religion does bad things. Um, I think that the two, again, there are I have a lot of responses to these, but um, the two I'm thinking of in relation to this particular conversation are first, um, the effort on the part of the secular sciences to demonize and overcome religion um, have has not worked, just hasn't worked. And in fact, the more the natural sciences try to demonize and overcome a particularly monotheistic uh, religion, uh, the more they intensify a kind of back reaction of religious traditions appealing to a particularly patriarchal, particularly paternalistic, and particularly earth-denying kind of theology. Um, so it's not, it hasn't, it hasn't worked well yet, and I don't know that it's a game that we want to keep playing. Um, the and and the problem in this kind of back and forth between a revivified patriarchal theism and a scientific. Um, atheism, sort of stalwart scientific atheism. Um, the problem, as, as one philosopher suggests, uh, her name is Grace Jansen, um, is that these two sides are still agreeing upon what they mean by God. That for somebody like Richard Dawkins and somebody, some, you know, Christian evangelical creationist, God means the same thing to both of them. God means a disembodied patriarchal dude in the sky who judges people and either sends them to heaven or hell. Now, Dawkins is going to say that guy doesn't exist, but he agrees conceptually that that's what God means. Um, What I want to suggest, along with this other philosopher um, who sort of paved this ground in the late 90s and then nobody listened to her because everybody hates pantheism, um, is that it might be a better idea rather than just arguing about whether or not this God exists, just to change our understanding of what God means. And we don't have to change our understanding of what God means by just sort of making up some idea. We could rather look at some of the traditions that Western monotheism has, you know, unsettled, bowled over, sort of concreted over um, in its effort to take over the whole world. Um, Some of these are... um, polytheistic traditions, some of these are animist traditions, um, which have different understandings of what we what we in the West call divinity, um, and maybe try to learn from those traditions rather than asserting, as the West has done since the 17th century, that ultimately we're all going to grow up and be rational atheists. Yeah, that's really wonderfully said. And, 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 and again, one of the things I was most excited about your book is the way that you um, helped... Uh, uh, you sort of you know nurtured the connections that were already implicit between some of these new materialisms, new ways of thinking about matter, uh, of the agential quality of, of of things in our world that that they're every everything's sort of pitching in to make reality happen in this kind of multitudinous way. The connections between um, new materialism and animism or indigenous worldviews. And it seems to me that we're at a very interesting phase of that relationship where where it's not really clear, you know, some people don't like it, as some people have kind of silly ideas about one side or the other side, but that a lot of the action has to do with really developing a kind of hybrid way of thinking that's not appropriating indigenous worldviews, that's mm-hmm. not just simply resting on some kind of... Um, 
you know, idea of of a, of a living earth that's 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 you know taken from some other tradition, but rather in, is inspired by that to to uh, widen what it ne- means to live in a world where objects and processes are alive and agential and re- in re- in constant renegotiated relationship. Um, mm-hmm. That actually helps us. Uh, right. modify and find our way into that. Um, but as you point out, there's also still resistance on that end too. Like some of the new materialists, yeah. they just talk about science. They don't want to talk about indigeneity. Um, right. And on the other side, you have indigenous thinkers who quite rightly are very resistant to people kind of mm-hmm. moving in and being like, oh, hey, these are great ideas. Let's all use them. Um, mm-hmm. How do you, you, do you, I mean, how do you see your work as as helping to to take this conversation forward and and what do you think are the real important issues right now in terms of that connection? Oh, um, I think the most important um, and most difficult and perhaps most counterintuitive move that we need to keep making um, is to remember that worldviews are different from one another. Um, we do not need all to convert one another to the same worldview. And in fact, efforts to do that have been disastrous, so we can just stop that. Um, but also, they're not inscrutable to one another, right? We can we can have different worldviews and or different um, worlds even, um, and even find ways to communicate across and through those worlds. So I think, for example, about and in this fraught intersection of um, technology and um, ecology and religion, and particularly indigenous religion, um, I think for about um, like the telescopes on Hawaiian mountains, right? Um, there's there has always been uh, indigenous resistance to building telescopes on these sacred mountains, and yet there they are. They're you know U.S. telescopes, university funded, right up there on mountains. Um, and there's been there's currently a drive to put another one up, and a lot of indigenous resistance to that. Um, understanding what the problem is with installing a telescope on this particular mountain um, requires an understanding of the agency of that mountain and the sacrality of that mountain, right? The sacred agency of that mountain. Um, But it does not require people who were not raised as native Hawaiians somehow to convert to that religion and start proclaiming the mountain to be animate and divine for themselves and to, you know, dress in a particular fashion and to, you know, take people's styles and to take their rituals and to take their right. That It doesn't require that degree of appropriation. It requires a degree of recognition and understanding. Um, so the mountain that is sacred for Native Hawaiians does not need to be sacred to the activists in Philadelphia. It just needs to be intelligible as sacred to the activist in Philadelphia. Does that does that distinction make sense? Absolutely. I mean it seems yeah. it seems to be one of the issues that that I'm also surprised by is how how hard it is for people to think you know capital P pluralistically. Yeah, that's right. And, and even though we we're in this pluralistic society and we're we're raised in pluralism, mm-hmm. multiculturalism, da da da, yeah, mm-hmm. it doesn't go so far, but you know, we kind of think of ourselves as pluralist, but but actual pluralist thinking, particularly when it involves ontology, claims about the right. ultimate reality, we quaver. We can't even deal with it. We, reality must be one. Right. It must be one reality. And it's a weird thing because once you let that go, it's actually not that complicated. Like you can actually right. suddenly have a lot of room to maneuver, but it remains a very challenging move for a lot of people to make. Yeah, I think we all remain secret Kantians, right? Well, if you're saying that everybody should, no, I'm not saying everybody should. <laughs> I'm saying that to this particular community from this particular vantage point, right? And you don't need to universalize it in order to make it important. Yeah, I guess it's that question of do you need um, do you need those universals to ground ethics? And that's one of the, you know, the, you, know you, you raise some outstanding issues with pantheism and you have nice rejoinders to a number of them, the problem of evil, but but one of them is if you have this sort of pluralistic, emergent, always in, in relationality, multitudinous kind of world, how do you develop the uh, the possibility of some kind of universal ethics that would enable right. things not to kind of uh, just devolve? 
Um, right. Not that we're well, not, I think that universal ahead. ethics have always been particular ethics, right? Universal ethics have always protected the interests of some people over the interests of others. Um, so letting go of a universalist ethic is only sort of living into what has always been the case, which is that ethics are relational and perspectival and situational. Um, and giving up this fantasy of being able to know in advance at all times and all places what kinds of decisions we're going to make about things. And I think one of the most difficult things for an ecological thinking is going to be to give up the a priori privilege of the human over, uh, over everybody else, right? We've operated as though one universalist eth ethical assumption we can make is that human interests are more important than the interests of termites, fine. Than the interests of groundhogs, fine. Than the interests of mountains, than the interests of fields, forests, trees, right? Um, it's going to be really difficult, and I don't even know that we have the time for it, you know, as a species, but it, it would be an admirable ethical task uh, to start from the ground and say, why don't we get rid of, again, this a priori privilege we've given to the category of the human? Well, you know, one interesting place that we're seeing that, and this ties around to something we talked about earlier, is our attitudes about the the world, out, uh, you know, off planet. You know mm -hmm. that that right. I think just today right. there was a group of scientists who you know announced that there should be a moratorium and not not there shouldn't be development of the majority of of the satellites and uh, planets and asteroids that are that are in the solar system and so we have a little we have an opportunity right now because it's it's so clear it's so clear the difference between going hey that stuff's just let's exploit it with robots it's great we need to have industry off the planet it's the new adventure of capitalism let's go for it and the kind of horror at oh my god are you oh my god we're just going to spread this stuff Right. Into this, right. <laughs> I mean, it's so obviously not human, not a human place. So, in a way, we have this opportunity. I'm not terribly optimistic, but we have the opportunity to see this distinction you're talking about very, very clearly. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, we unfortunately got to wrap it up here. Uh, this is, as always, there's there's not enough time, and I I will ask you to stay on uh, afterwards and maybe uh, talk to me a little bit l uh, longer for uh, eventual. Uh, uh, availability, <laughs> but I did sure. want to mention this uh, conference that you're going to be in in in, in England called uh, "How the Light Gets In." It's sort of an unusual uh, conference bringing together philo philosophers and uh, and music. What? what yeah, is that? that's right. It's gonna it's an outdoor festival. Um, there's you, registration is still open. It's called "How the Light Gets In." Um, you can go and live in a yurt for a couple of days um, and uh, listen to some wonderful music and uh, hear some people debate passionately um, ideas about us and our place in the universe. Well, wonderful. So we'll, uh, we'll have to end it there with uh, Mary Jane Rubenstein, the book, Pantheologies, Gods, Worlds, uh, Monsters. Thanks again for joining us on Expanding Mind. Of course. Thank you so much for the invitation. Until next week, folks, keep your minds open. Mm -hmm.